Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, January 23rd, 2019 edition of the Sands and its Storm Zoners Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Well, this, I guess, is sort of a DNS kind of week, and today we have a diary by Xavier showing you how to use MISP in order to create response policy zones. So MISP used to stand for Malware Information Sharing Platform, but they really see it now sort of as an open source threat intelligent platform. So more than malware, you can collect things like IP addresses, hashes, uh, host names, and associated information about uh, various uh, malicious events. Now, the script that Xavier posted will allow you to export data from MISP and turn it into a response policy zone. So these response policy zones are a feature in DNS servers that allow you to overwrite how the DNS server would normally respond. So for all of these malicious host names, you can tell the DNS server now to actually respond with an IP address that for example, points to a sensor that will then alert you whenever a user does connect to it. For example, one of our other handlers, Guy, posted about this a couple times and he wrote a little sort of DNS sinkhole that takes advantage of just this principle. But the nice thing with Xavier is that you can take all the information that you have in MISP and then easily with a simple shell script, turn it into these response policy zones and actually take action against any host connecting to one of these malicious host names. And yes, uh, this method is also often called DNS firewalling because essentially you're using your DNS server to block outbound requests. And if you're using a Debian based Linux system and you're probably familiar with apt. Apt is a tool that allows you to install packages from remote repositories. Of course, uh, apt itself is a pretty dangerous tool. It has to run as root to do what it's supposed to do. And it will not just download a package, it will also install it, which means it will run arbitrary code. So it may surprise you somewhat that a lot of this happens over HTTP. Most of the commonly used Debian repositories use HTTP instead of HTTPS, in part because you often download large files from these repositories and the maintainers would like to encourage people to locally cache this content. Now to still keep stuff secure, they do use hashes, they do use digital signatures in order to protect the integrity of any downloads. However, it appears that anything but the very most recent version of apt has a vulnerability that does not properly check the signatures. And the vulnerability here is something that actually is quite common in that the signatures are verified but the entire file is trusted, not just the sign part. If you ever looked at a PGP signed document, you may have seen the begin PGP signature and end PGP signature lines. Anything between those two lines is verified, but then additional content could be added that does not really disturb this signed part of the message and the signature will still verify just fine. And that exactly is what appears to be happening here. An attacker could add additional content in front or after uh, this signature line and apt would just accept it as valid. Now, this vulnerability has just been fixed in order to exploit this. An attacker, of course, would need some form of man in the middle position in order to inject the malicious content or inject redirects. You can actually disable HTTP redirects in apt. That works, but isn't really all that useful because most of the default uh, repositories will redirect you to mirrors. So it will only work if you also change to a non default repository. Repository. So the real solution here is of course to update. Now you have to use apt in order to update. So you have still that one hurdle to overcome and hopefully that'll be done safely. 
And of course, installing packages is always a little bit an exercise in who you trust. And yes, these official repositories are usually where you should go. Well, if you are using PHP and you try to download a package from the official pair repository, you, this may have failed in the last couple days because pair.php.net was at least temporarily shut down in order to clean up after a compromised installer was actually uploaded and on the site for about the last half year. Not a lot of details yet as to what's the exact extent of uh, this particular incident. Uh, the website, like I said, is pretty much down. There's just a small notice pointing to the pair Twitter and GitHub channels. And Apple today yet again updated pretty much everything, Mac OS, iOS, watch OS, TV OS. There is also an update for iCloud for Windows. As usual, there is a lot of overlap between those different updates. The couple of orbits that sort of caught my eye uh, when I was skimming through them earlier. One uh, arbitrary remote code execution vulnerability in Bluetooth. I think that only affects iOS. There is also a vulnerability in FaceTime again, where if you're accepting a FaceTime call, the caller could execute arbitrary code. That affects uh, pretty much all of the operating systems, at least the ones uh, that do uh, support uh, FaceTime. And then again, a lot of WebKit vulnerabilities are being fixed here. So they affect Safari or anything else uh, really on an Apple product that does parse HTML pages. This update also fixes the SQLite vulnerability that was announced last year. Uh, that's an open source library. So this vulnerability has been out there for quite a while and SQLite is used in pretty much all Apple products. Well, uh, that's it for today. And if you happen to be in Jacksonville on Friday, I'll be speaking at the InfraGuard meetings at noon or around noon, I think starts 11.30 at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement building close to downtown. Just uh, Google Jacksonville InfraGuard and you should find the details. Thanks and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.